I'd like to introduce Dave Miller, the director of the new membership division, because that's part of the job we have to do. It's only part of it. Dave? I'd like to say that nothing could make me more pleased today than to be in front of this crowd of what I consider to be the most important people in the United States today, and that's you, the farmer and rancher of America. And it's a pleasure to be here because many of you over the past year I've met personally, and I have great confidence in the ability of this organization to reach its goals because I know from firsthand information, from meeting the people across this United States that I've met and worked with, that you are the type of people, you're the caliber of person who can accomplish the job that you've set out to do. This convention, I think, will be a real milestone in the history of NFO, where we'll complete the job that we've started out to do. I want to talk to you today about this new department that has come into being over the past year. The field staff department was split last spring into new membership department and field staff. Our one goal in new membership is to build and build and multiply our membership to the point that we have that 30 percent that it takes to achieve our ultimate goal of giving us cost of production plus a profit. It's taken some time over the past year to put a staff together, to get acquainted with the members across this country who are really interested and dedicated to achieving the goal that we've set out to reach. But I'm happy to say that we've seen some real progress. We've had some outstanding results from the work that we've set out to do. We went into Missouri last August with a team of men to work membership, to talk to the farmers who weren't members of NFO, and we found that they were more receptive than we would ever have believed. In a three-week period of time there in southwest Missouri and northern Arkansas, there were 72 new members enrolled in a three-week period. And this was very encouraging to us. So we said, well, we're going to go back and improve on what we've done. We're going to put things together in a little better fashion. We're going to learn from what we did in the past and do a better job. This past week in the state of Idaho, in Jerome County, we had some people working, and they enrolled 11% of the farmers that they talked to on the first contact that they made with them. And the impressive thing about this is that another 75% of those farmers agreed that NFO was the answer to the problems that we have in agriculture today and they will become members within a short period of time. So we know that the farmer and rancher today has the right attitude. He accepts NFO as the answer to his dilemma. And now it's up to you and me as members of NFO to go out to that man and explain to him exactly what NFO is. 
explain to him that over the past five or six years, you've put together a system of collection, dispatch, and delivery that is unequal anywhere, that you have the ability and the capability to move his commodity out of the old marketing system and into a new marketing system that will ultimately give us the power to price the products that we produce. The formula for success in enrolling new members is simple. I didn't say it was easy, but I said it was simple. I don't know how many of you people here have ever been down in the Ozarks in southwest Missouri where there's a lot of rocks and hills. But I've used this illustration a time or two and I think it's effective. I've dug a lot of post holes down there to keep them old cows in and there's nothing complicated about it, but it sure ain't easy. So we've got a simple formula today that if you'll use it, we can be well assured of increasing our membership and giving us enough members, enough production to make our programs a complete success over this year. The most important person in enrolling new members is the member we already have who is committed to the job that he has to do. Every one of us, when we started out on the farm, we made a decision that we were going to make that farm work, that we were going to make it pay off. And just because we stubbed our toe a time or two, we didn't back off from that commitment and that decision. And that's, a, that's exactly what I'm asking each of you to do today, is to make a firm decision and a firm commitment in your mind today before you leave this auditorium, and before you leave this convention, that I am going to do my part to see that Operation 30, the clincher, works this year. I'm going to go out and I'm going to enroll a member. I'm going to go for a goal of one member a week, one member a month. I don't care where you set your goal, but create a plan and work that plan. Make sure that you set aside a specific amount of time each week, each day, however you intend to do it, to go talk to a farmer who isn't a member. We've got a beautiful crowd of people here today. And can you imagine the effect that we can have on the market come January 1, when each of you go out and enroll just one member, just one, and put his production through the collection, dispatch, and delivery system? We can turn markets upside down. I'd like to talk a little bit about membership committees and how they should function. I'm going to hit it very briefly because we have two meetings scheduled tomorrow where we'll have two hours and each of you who's really interested and really dedicated to increasing our membership, we'd like to have you in those meetings at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Pick up the information out at our booth. But basically, each of you should be considering between now and January 1 when you start your elections who you want from your county on a membership committee. You know, each of us have a job to do in NFO, just like each implement on your farm has a specific job to do. And in order to be successful and to keep the ball rolling, someone has to take charge and take an interest in seeing that each specific job is accomplished. And our job is to get a membership committee together in your county who will plan a schedule and then work that plan 
so that you can accomplish the goals that you set out to accomplish. Be sure that you select people who are enthusiastic, who want to make their county the best county in the state of whatever state you're from. Make sure that we really consider each individual when we elect our membership committee in January. And then work with us from the home office. We'll help you coordinate it. Uh, any information that we can help you with, we're more than happy to do it. And it's the responsibility of one man in the county to make it work, and that's that membership committee chairman. It, that responsibility is on his shoulders to see that membership work is done, that farmers who aren't, who aren't members of NFO are contacted on a regular basis to explain collective bargaining to that man who isn't yet a member. As I said before, the attitude of the farmer who isn't yet a member of NFO is terrific. He's not going to fight you. He knows that the only way that he can accomplish his goals as an individual is to receive a fair price for what he produces. And the only way he can do that is to organize. And it's just simply up to us to provide him with the proper information and the proper direction and goals so that he can become a part of what you work for. I think that today is the day that we should make a decision. I'm pleased, as I said at the outset, to be here with this wonderful crowd, but I'm not very pleased when I have to take my commodities and turn them over to someone else at less than my cost of production. In fact, I can get pretty upset about the fact that I work all year long to produce a crop of calves, and when that year is up, I can't get back out of them what they cost me to produce. And when we make that commitment, when we get riled up enough to say, this is it, now's the time to do it, Let's get behind Operation 30. Let's get behind NFO. Let's enroll the members that we need to make our program 100% success. Thank you very much. Roger Slotik, Director of Field Staff Department of the NFO. Roger. Last year at our convention, I reported to you that about three months prior to that meeting, we had started to develop a team collection effort on all back dues, and that we thought we had something that might work. Well, it worked, and it's continued to work. The field staff department took the challenge that the Securities Exchange and several other groups in the country had given this organization. And they said that probably if we had to litigate all the back dues that were out, we could probably collect 3%. Well, after 14 months and accurate record keeping on a business-like basis, on the first contact our teams right now and have held an average for the whole year the first stop, they are collecting 25% of all the dues that they talk to in any one given day. <clears throat> that 25% shows an increase of 
productivity increase for every staff man working for this department. The costs are somewhere around direct cost to put a man in a car, two men in a car down the road to contact these people. The direct cost is somewhere around 34 cents for every dollar picked up. Last spring, as Dave Miller said, we split the field staff department into new membership and into a field staff division. Since that time, we have split field staff into three separate divisions, a collections division, a legal division, and a regional supervisor division. And through a series of methodical steps, we are in the process of collecting dues, bringing membership list current, setting precedent in court, in state courts, to test in every state court, county court, the legality of the membership agreement. Even though this has been done in federal court, you still have to do it in a lot of areas in the state and the local courts. The teams are going to continue to function for the next year. Right now, we've got 180-some cases pending on various stages of litigation of the contract, the membership agreement. We have some 80 lawyers working in part-time capacities with us. And through those two steps, we'll continue to work on the back due situation. Also, after we go through an area with the teams, <clears throat> we are trying to assign, and as of right now, we have 17 people, or will have by the first of the year, who we are putting back into the counties. These are people who've worked on the teams, some of them have already worked in the areas, to work with the members, to service the members after the teams go through and bring up the list up to date. Now, how fast we're going to be able to continue and to expand this program depends on several things. But before we put a man out there over a group of members to service them, that man has got to be the best quality man we can get because from that nucleus in every county and every state is where we're going to build this entire organization on. And those people are going to be selected. They're going to be the best that field staff department has got to offer. So I'm not going to go into it, run through it, and shotgun the thing fast. We're going to find the right people for the right areas, and then we'll build. And their job will be to keep those $75 dues current so we never get back and go through a situation like we went through the last year. That will be their first job. <clears throat> and after that, they will assist the other commodity departments in signing production, and they will also work with county presidents, county officers, county committees, wherever needed, to see that committees are set up that they function the best way that they possibly can. But that is their second goal. Along with those people, when we assign them to the area, to an area, and we're assigning them this time instead of to a geographical area, they are assigned names of members that they're going to be working with. For management reasons, it's a lot easier to control than if you put a man in 15 or 20 counties, because we know what people he's supposed to contact, who he has to contact every month, and then on an ongoing basis, he'll go back and contact them to keep production moving and to help keep the problems to a minimum out in the area. After the 1st of January, Bob Arndt is going to go out in the areas where we now have regionals, and he is going to set up zone area meetings to bring five or six counties together, all the elected officers in those counties, and we have put a program together with the assistance of our man in that area to help you develop the best county meeting system that we can possibly do. Those meetings, we're having critiques of those meetings tomorrow. I would encourage everybody, I know you've got cost of production meetings going on, 
but as many of you as possible, we would like to have you to those meetings, and we're going to go into detail how we're going to do it. But this fits right in with what the regional supervisor is going to be doing after he is assigned back to those areas. You can put a staff man out over a group of members. The key is still going to be the ability of the membership itself in any given county to assist and back up that staff man. If we'd have to do the job to get it done ourselves, this regional supervisor, he'd probably get himself squared away and probably 10 people. But he can multiply himself through you, the elected officials in the counties, and make the clincher a reality. So we encourage you to come to those meetings when we start out there after the 1st of January and work with our people out in the country. The structure in this organization today is the most important it has ever been in the 15 years this organization has been in inception. The county structure is still the key to NFO, people. Those committees that function, that gather information, that get contract for sales with grain and cattle on them will always be the most important duties the most important positions that can be held in this organization because without that we don't have anything. To give you some idea, quite by accident, I came across last summer a document that I just want to share with you for a minute. But to give you some idea what our competition, what our competitors, what vested interests have done in this country to know what they have got out there to work with. I have a copy of a printout that goes by county, that is put out by a national publication, and it is available in this printout it gives you the name of all the farmers or a great percentage of the farmers in any given county in the United States. I've not seen the whole list, but I understand, and from what I've checked out on what I have before me, this list tells the name, the address, the county, the age, the number of acres he owns, what his gross income is, or what his gross income is between two areas or two dollar figures, and what he produces on that acres that he owns, the number of cattle, the number of sows, the number of feeder calves, the number of chickens, the tons of commercial fertilizer and commercial feed that he buys, how many trucks, how many tractors, how many combines that man owns. Agribusiness has availability to these. They keep their own. They know where to put their people. If you was a fertilizer dealer, you'd know who in your area you wanted to go talk to. If you was a tire dealer, you'd know who to go talk to. People, we have got to develop the same thing in NFO is what I'm talking about, what these other people have got, because they are our competition. And we must be as efficient and businesslike as they are if we're going to succeed. And we can do it if we work together. And if we work together, we can honestly clinch it down in 1977. Thank you. <clears throat> the department that's making real progress that has a great opportunity with a commodity that's had many problems and still does, but has a great opportunity through the NFO to meet those problems. And at this time, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Bill Salhorst, Director of the Fat Cattle Division. Bill? <laughs> Members of NFO, 
officers and guests. The last four days have been probably the most eventful and the most rewarding time that any of us have spent in the history of NFO. Because, as many of us see it, we came to a national convention of NFO for the first time as long as this organization has been in existence for the right reasons. And that was to get together as a total group in a common endeavor to determine you need it up out there, up in the uh, North Carolina section, over to my right. Anybody else who has a problem? Is that, is that fine, Marv? Can you hear it now? Okay. Anybody else? As I was saying, we've come together in a common cause to develop the ways and the means to improve our prices for agricultural commodities. More important than that, we developed a historic moment in this organization in that, as a result of the activity yesterday and last night, we're going to have people talking about price in its proper perspective. We're going to have people talking about 65 and a quarter for fat cattle rather than two bits more than the neighbor at 38 or 40. And I, for one, feel good about the progress that has been made. The attitude of the NFO members and the attitude of those who are not members is better than I have seen it in the years that I've been a member of NFO, and that goes back to 1961. There isn't a week goes by that we don't receive from five to seven phone calls in the cattle division from someone who is not a member of NFO asking us who he can see in his home county to become a member. Now, I like that, but on the other hand, it worries me a little bit because it tells me there's a communications gap in that particular county that that happens. But the attitude of those who are not members has never been as good as it is now. Those of us that are members of NFO have to understand that the educational process is one that we must undertake. And too many times, NFO members ha have a little bit too much or too little patience. You walk up to a fellow who's not a member of NFO, you explain it all to him, he doesn't quite understand it, and you say, I just can't understand why that dummy can't understand what I'm saying. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. A man who is not a member of NFO is exactly to this organization in the educational process as a six-year-old child is to the first year in school or the first day in school. If that six-year-old child went to school the first day and the teacher attempted to cram him or her with seventh grade algebra and the child couldn't understand it and the teacher says, why don't you go home, you little dummy? You wouldn't have a child that would ever understand, would you? And some of you have done that to non-members. You've walked up to him, you're a member of NFO for 12 years, you tried to cram him with your 12 years knowledge in one hour, he couldn't quite understand it, and you turned away from him in disgust and said, well, that dummy don't know nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, it took nine visits. It took nine visits on my farm and 90 days for me to become a member of NFO. And I know I don't have as much intelligence as a lot of them, but I'll tell you one thing, when I became one, I understood it and I became a right one, I think. I believe I'm a pretty good member of NFO. I know one thing, my cattle are signed on a contract for sale for a year at a time. And they all go through the program. And there aren't any questions about that. And if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for all of you.
Last spring, during the marketing vacation, some were concerned that the Packers would desert us as a result of that activity. We called all of them. We told them what we were going to do. Without an exception, they said, Bill, you would have to do what you have to do. While we went through the marketing vacation, we started back in. All of those 22 Packers we did business with. Since then, we have increased that to 33. We've had a one-third increase since last March of the amount of Packers that we are doing business with. We have 10 more that I can call Monday morning if the volume of production on contract for sale is sufficient that we can be doing business with by Tuesday. That'll make 42. Now, that doesn't really tell me that the industry isn't ready to work with the farmers. Packer after packer after packer that I talk to, and this is the terminology they use, they say, Bill, we're going to have to develop a common cause alliance between the processors and the producers to whip the chain stores into line. Now, if they can understand it, certainly we as producers should be able to. The gentleman from High Grade Foods Corporation who spoke yesterday, and some of you heard him, made this statement. He said, it doesn't make us any difference what price we pay for fat cattle. It can be $40, it can be $60, or it can be higher than that. That makes us no difference, so long as our competitors pay the first, and if you want it, this is what it's going to cost you. Now, that's not hard to do, but it does take some guts. And you can't worry about that maybe somebody may not like you for that. They may not like us for that, but ladies and gentlemen, they will respect us. And I'd a whole lot rather be respected than loved when it comes to processors. There is a difference. <clears throat> So what do we do starting Monday morning? Well, first of all, before we leave here, any of you who have, as of yet, not signed your cattle on a contract for sale for a six-month span, I invite you to stop past our cattle booth and see any one of the fellas there and do that. As Butch Swaim used to say, we can't do business with an empty wagon. And if I'm going to call Packers Monday morning, which we will, there better be some steers, heifers, cows, and bulls to back up that call. So if you haven't signed them up, that we certainly expect you to do. Beginning Monday, every collection point coordinator will be instructed to meet with the cattle committees of those counties that normally participate through his collection point. They're going to be asked to meet with those people to develop the names of the cattle producers in each of those counties and divide those contacts up and make them systematically with an educational process that will bring people to the organization. That will start Monday. Also beginning Monday, We'll be initiating the contract for sale in all the collection points on a permanent basis. In other words, the contract for sale will now become a permanent part of the cattle program. We're going to expect every producer to place their cattle on a contract for sale. You're going to have a, some problems with some of them, but keep working with them, and over a period of time, I'm sure they will do it. The cattle will be scheduled through the home office as we have been presently doing. We have found that that system works well. And also, we will be establishing new collection points in those areas that are now presently not being served by a collection point. In other words, before this next winter is over with, before 1st of April comes, 
the total structure will be totally put together. And ladies and gentlemen, the attitude that I see at this convention and what I've experienced, and I, I've never felt better in my whole life, tells me that the cattle feeders and the cowmen of this country have finally now begin, begun to see the light. Maybe the equity in the cattle business has gotten so low that we finally have reached a point of realization. So, in summation, let me say this to all of you. This is undoubtedly the finest convention that this organization has ever had. And to a few of the doubting Thomases that before the convention said, well, you ain't going to have much to do there, and I'm, I don't suppose you're going to have too big a crowd, I'd like to remind them that there's about 2,000 more this year than there were last year, so they can forget about that problem. <laughs> you're here because you care enough. The meeting in field staff this morning, I understand, was standing room only. Last year, if we'd have talked about picking up a county and working some dues, everybody would have run for the weeds. This morning, we got them standing in line wanting to do it. That's an awful departure from a year ago, I'll tell you. So, ladies and gentlemen, my invitation to you is this. Those of us in the cattle division and all of us in NFO are going to do all we possibly can to ensure justice for the American farmer. As Ornley has said so many times, not for NFO, not for Bill Salhorst, but for all of us. You know, one thing that we as farmers still have is a lot of pride. And by jingle, we put a few dollars in our pocket. That pride's going to shine a lot more than it has. So my invitation to you is, starting Monday morning, have a lot of patience, be an ambassador of NFO, talk to your friends and neighbors, sign your cattle on a contract for sale, and if you have a problem in your area, keep a cool head, give us a call, we'll help you with it, and good Lord willing, we'll come back here next year with 65 and a quarter on fat cattle like we said last night we're supposed to have. Thanks a lot, God bless you, and I love every one of you. Next. Members, delegates, and guests, your grain department this past year has had solid growth in both volume blocked and volume sold. Because as NFO members, we have built a system that we have confidence in, both in accountability and document control. And we have gone down the roads and we have put production together to go through the nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system. The nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system that we have put together is made up of facilities which allow our members to accumulate grain that we know what quality we're shipping before it leaves that facility. And the second thing is transportation where we have the capability of delivering it either truck direct to buyer by barge or by rail or into the direct export market by vessel. We have the capability to go direct export. We have proven that. But even more so, we set out on that first direct export sale that we made to prove first that we had the capability of transporting it directly overseas to that buyer's port of call. And the second thing that we set out to prove is that we as farmers in this country produce a quality product and that if the foreign buyers overseas want a quality product, they know where they can come to get it. But you know the one thing that is going to help us put the production together that we need to put together that 30 percent so that we can hold our meetings is the one thing that has proved to us in the past 
that we could organize farmers and ranchers faster than anyone else has ever done, and that we had the most thorough communication system in this country. And that is a commodity Minuteman structure where we would have the strength to go out and block that production together that we need. The Commodity Minuteman structure is comprised of a county grain coordinator, four community chairmen, three assistant community chairmen, and four members under each assistant community chairman. That's 66 grain producers in each county. And with just 15,000 bushels of grain signed up going through the program, from each one of those members is a million bushels of grain in each county. And when we put that in just a thousand NFO grain counties nationwide, we have a billion bushels of grain available and ready to go through the program. But that commodity Minuteman structure in grain will also keep our members informed of every action that we need to take in one united effort so our members know nationwide what each action, what each step, what each block that we're putting together needs to be done. But there's one thing in the meeting last night that I'd like to ask you, and that is that we leave this convention to work to make our pricing goals in grain a reality. And the way we can get that done is by first making a decision before we leave this convention to commit 100 percent of, of our production on a grain contract for sale. And second, to put volume blocks of grain together to go into this market whether it be for direct export, for export movement, or for domestic movement, so that we can keep and build our prices, build those prices to where we have established our goals at. But I, in closing, I ask you, when Monday morning comes, to do two things, and that is to meet with the leaders in your county, set the structure up, and secondly, to talk to your neighbor and ask him to commit his production with you so that we can be working together and put that 30 percent together. So that we can show these old line buyers out here in the country what collective bargaining is all about. Thank you. We have a new division that is very important. Not only must this be the effort of the men, but we must call on the efforts of the wives and the ladies in this country because they are a part of every farming and ranching operation. They must understand, but they must use their influence. And when a job isn't done, they must urge that it be done. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Doris McElwain in charge of the Ladies' Division. Thank you. Before I start, I would like to make an announcement. There will be a news release available that you can take home for your local media. It has the target prices in it and it will be available at both of the main rear exits. So take them home with you and get them into your local media. Fellow members of NFO, the 21st National Convention of the National Farmers Organization is drawing to a close, but what we have done here, in my opinion, is more powerful in terms of history than anything we have done before. 
those marvelous years of the 60s with the excitement of the Prairie Fire Organization of the NFO across the country and the epic intensity of the holding actions and the struggles that followed that threatened our very existence, those were important years. But other men and women before us had organized as protest groups that died before they were capable of ever modifying the industry procurement system that farmers and ranchers have labored under for generations. This 21st NFO convention has set us apart from all earlier efforts at agricultural price reform. We have catapulted to an alternate to the old farm the farmer system and to me that's as exciting as a holding action. Not nearly as much fun though, but the most powerful move we've ever made. Personally, I feel that this is a landmark year for my membership agreement. I have not missed a national convention since 1965, but this is the first one that has been devoted to what I joined NFO for, collective bargaining. Don't you feel pretty good about it too? <laughs> 21 used to be recognized as the coming of age milestone. Recent legislation now says 18 is. Well, we have that covered too. 18 years ago, NFO set themselves apart from other marketing and service organizations by being leaders, leaders in the collective bargaining field. We adopted the membership agreement. The bargaining for agriculture this year, we are to point with pride to the capable and ready systems backing up our ongoing commodity programs. And each and every one of us here are to be commended for taking the time and the resources to attend this truly collective bargaining commodity convention. It is through this foresight and the commitment to yourselves through NFO that we will be able to go forth with what JFK called renewed vigor in 1977. These convention activities that have participated and cooperated in all of us make it possible to conduct the necessary program advancements between this and the next convention. You and I are the NFO. You and I are our own best reasons for being here. There are two main things that should have come through loud and clear at this convention. Number one, we have the tools to do what we have to do in order to get cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And number two, there are no shortcuts. Block, bargain, sell together. That is the only way you can complete the cycle. 1977 is the year I expect women to quit hiding their light under a bushel, as the saying goes. Gals, we are NFO members. We don't have to wait for any other excuse to function. I am not talking about women's lib. I'm talking about farmers' lib. It is our fight as much as the men folks. I consider myself a farmer, and you are too if you married one. County election time is coming up next month. If you have the courage and the capability to help your county become more fully mobilized in this fight for cost of production plus a reasonable profit, please make yourself available for the leadership responsibilities that must be accepted. There are many of you who have that talent. A word of encouragement from your spouse would work wonders, I'm sure. 
so how about it, fellas? You can use our help, can't you? We all know that an N NFO membership agreement where both the husband and wife are informed and active makes a strong and effective membership. It also makes a stable, functioning county. Wives are not silent partners. They have a right to know. They have a responsibility to know how they can help. I have two religions. NFO is one of them. It's a matter of commitment. What we do, not what we say, makes the difference. I think it took a while to realize the depth of our commitment, but it was, and still is, the only hope we have for ever becoming our own man in the marketplace. Without that, all we can ever hope to do is to continue to serve the procurement system of industry. If we are not willing to commit ourselves to changing the system, it cannot be changed. Let's make a commitment as a family, a farm family. The stakes are exactly the same for the farm women and farm children as it is for farm men. There are two specific things I'm asking you ladies to do to help with the winter's activities, and I'm asking you to do it specifically. When the elections take place, besides considering the acceptance of elected positions, there are two very important things. Number one, see to it that that new roster of officers is sent into the home office within 24 hours. We cannot have an action group if we don't know who to contact. 24 hours should be the longest time between an election and getting it in the mail. Number two, see to it that that roster also includes the name of a woman in your county that is willing to be the women's activity coordinator there. Now, we're not talking about rallying the women into a separate club or auxiliary. We are making the effort to strengthen the basic NFO unit by encouraging the wives to begin attending meetings regularly and devote some of their talents and energies to the only organization in the country that farmers have that is talking about profit for farmers and the only ones with the machinery to get it. Although poor farm prices are a pity, we should not feel sorry for farmers. Relief is only two sheets of paper away. The membership agreement of the National Farmers Organization and the NFO commitment for sale. There is one thing that you need to remember if you're considering that these two pieces of paper are legal documents. They should be. That's the way people do business but you have an opportunity to use it for collective bargaining. If you're not willing to do it on paper, then we have to assume that you're interested in price advantage. And that is not ever going to get the job done. If you're only going to sell once, then go after that quarter more. If you plan to be around next month or next year, then you'd better look ahead at the dollar level and not the cents. You cannot have collective bargaining and 25 cents more. You can have one, but you can't have both. There are no shortcuts. There are a few facts and myths that I would like for you to be thinking about through the coming year. That is, if you need extra encouragement as members to keep on pushing yourselves for NFO. Fact one, the total farm production expense for 1975 was $75.5 billion. That expense was up 4% from 1974. The total farm net income for 75 
was $25.5 billion, which was down 4% from 1974. Therefore, 1975 was 8% worse than the year before. And from the USDA pamphlet, Secret of Affluence, they say for 1975, the farmer did not quite get back 3.5% on his investment, and he threw in his labor for nothing. Total farm liabilities for 1975, that means what you owe, is 81 point eight billion dollars. I think if we would figure that out, that's probably the second highest per capita bill next to the national debt. And there's not very many of us to pay it off. Fact two, the industry is not going to give up their control on farm prices without a fight. They will use the circumstances reflected in the figures I just gave you to their advantage. You will see new credit gimmicks and bait in many forms. But think about it. Even a so-called interest-free loan has the hook under the fat worm. Slavery, Mankey called it. But I think we all know there's no such thing as a free lunch. You just have to keep reminding yourself once in a while. Fact three. The only way to get out of low industry set farm prices and avoid the temptation of the last resort credit traps that are abating you is NFO. And don't you forget it. There are a couple of myths that we should try to get worked out of our brains this winter, too. Number one, there's a myth that says farmers are hard headed businessmen. Well, we're not setting our prices, so we're not businessmen. So we're only half right, hard-headed. Myth two, farmers can be neutral if they don't join NFO. Well, you know better than that. There is no third neutral way to market. You either market the old way and strengthen that system, or you market through the NFO and you strengthen our system. You would have to put half into each system just to be neutral. And that wouldn't make much sense, would it? That's why our collection, dispatch, and delivery system is so important, and these links must be supported. Come sunshine or high water, they are not for a whipping post, but they are a king like in a checker game you now have the ability to begin pulling the production away from the old system. And you had better support them because the only other way is the other way. Myth three, the present marketing system is okay. The farmers are just not making the law of supply and demand work for them. Well, that old LSD formula, law of supply and demand, if it was working, it would be immoral. If people had to be hungry in order for us to get a price. Nope, the system has to be changed. We have an orderly, a truly orderly marketing arrangement. When the industry says orderly marketing, they mean a steady supply at a low price when they want it. We mean a steady supply at a previously agreed cost of production plus a profit contract and then we deliver orderly, and that's what orderly marketing really is. Another variation of this myth is that someday we can get justice at the marketplace if we get a sympathetic administration in government. I would remind you that what government giveth, they can also taketh away. False security blankets have gotten us nowhere. We can depend only on ourselves. Profit is locked in by NFO group contracts, and they will keep only as long as the group remains strong. If you leave the bunch, you get like bananas. You get peeled one at a time. The next one, farmers and ranchers don't have to say, pardon me, big, big farmers and ranchers don't have to say, what will you give me? But I would love for anybody in the audience to tell me what's the difference in what will you give me and saying, what's the market? 
we use this phrase to give ourselves a stance of mock dignity in the presence of buyers. The expression, what's the market, is just as phony as the market. If you are not setting your price, no matter how big you are, you still need others to change the system. And when a half a dozen or less ultimate buyers are buying nationwide, how can the largest producer compete? That's why large producers need NFO, the same reason small ones do. The biggest myth of all is that farmers and ranchers are rugged individualists, that they are independent. For generations, farmers and ranchers have been conned into seeing themselves as rugged individualists. Conned is sort of a cute phrase meaning suckered. We've been suckered into the fantasy that because we live on the land, that makes us rugged individualists. Well, it ain't so, but we darn sure make it rugged on ourselves by acting separately, being unorganized, and fancying ourselves to be the romantic rugged individualist. We've been kitted into thinking that outward appearances make us independent, something like the Marlboro Man, perhaps. That's pretty smart, because if we already think we're independent, we won't be busting a gut trying to be independent. So for the moment, let's really look at ourselves. Is the outward appearance image of agribusiness advertising blinding us to what's real? It isn't handling six or 10 digit cash flow or having a million dollar mortgage that makes us independent, is it? It isn't sheds of machinery or bins and feedlots of production that makes us independent, is it? It isn't signing processor dictated contracts or hedging the futures to try to make a dime or a dollar more than our neighbor that makes us independent, is it? You know what will if you think about it. It is having something to say about the entire pricing structure so that we can price our own products. Now, isn't that what will make us independent? I am. No one can do it for us. We own the production first. The choice is ours. Operation 30 is the clincher. My kids will never say to me, your generation could have changed it. Why didn't you try harder? What are your kids going to say? What will your neighbor's kids say to their folks? We've got the clincher. Let's put the hammer down. Thank you. There's one thing I want to add.